she was pregnant, um, she needed, uh, the, the choice was um, abort the, the pregnancy, terminate the pregnancy, or both she and the child would die. And the nun who was in charge of that unit made the choice to terminate the pregnancy and was excommunicated, thrown out of her order, and fired from her job. Do we want those kinds of critical decisions to be framed by that, by that fear? Do we want critical decisions in our lives to be framed by that fear? She did what was right. She was eventually reinstated, but in the moment, she had to know that making a choice to terminate a pregnancy stood against everything that the Roman Catholic Church tells her about what that means and that making that choice would likely mean harsh consequences. Do we want someone in that role with that kind of fear? I don't think so. I certainly don't. When um, first talking about this, when Kurt and I were talking about this, um, the other thing he brought up and the other thing that gets brought up is the whole question of end of life issues. Um, Reproductive health is one thing, end of life issues. And um, I thought to myself, well, you know, if we look at the, the range of moral theology that goes into decisions about reproductive health, in particular about birth control, right, the frame around birth control, they don't allow artificial means, which means any barrier means, hormonal changes that, that disallow um, ovulation. So they, that they, they say this is not natural. This is not natural. This is not the way that God intended us to be. This is using artificial means and for this very intimate um, piece of the marriage bond, um, we want that to be as close as possible. And so this, is, this interrupts that. It's the moral theology, natural, natural theology, natural law. Um, so with that frame in mind, I thought to myself, now how could this be a problem? How could this be a problem at the end of life? Because part of what you get at the end of life, some of you would know this anyhow, is the, the, one of the really critical places um, is the whole question of nutrition and hydration for someone who is um, incapable of, of eating and drinking on their own. This is one of the critical areas where you have to, when you do your advanced directives, this is one of the critical areas you have to make decisions about when, how, where. So I was intrigued reading through this long document. Here's what um, the Catholic bishops had to say about that. They say, the church's teaching authority has addressed the moral issues concerning medically assisted nutrition and hydration. We are guided on this issue by Catholic teaching against euthanasia, which is, quote, an action or omission which of itself or by intention causes death in order that all suffering may in this way be eliminated. They go on. While medically assisted nutrition and hydration are not morally obligatory in certain cases, these forms of basic care should in principle be provided to all patients who need them, including patients diagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state, because even the most severely debilitated and helpless patient retains the full dignity of a human person and must receive ordinary and Proportionate care. Ordinary and proportionate care. <coughs> it could be on the basis of protecting the vulnerable that you could be forced to continue hydration and nutrition for a patient who is never going to come back. Do we want this theology making decisions about our health care and what we can do. It's true also and important to keep in mind that the teaching of the church in the day-to-day -day life in hospital settings um, where many if not most of the doctors and nurses and other care providers are not Catholic, um, the, the, the moral life of the church and the day-to-day -day happenings are not always the same. Um, some years ago, a bunch of years ago, when I was in Spokane, 
a member of my congregation was in a severe car accident driving from Seattle back over to Spokane, rolled his, his convertible a couple of times, got up and walked away from it and seemed fine until about a week and a half later when his body started shutting down and he went into a coma. And um, I was with his family, we were sitting by his bedside and his breathing was just um, stuttering and, and shifting and they every time he inhaled they would look at him and they would wait um, to see if he was going to exhale and inhale again and it was just painful. It was so painful to sit in that room with them. You, some of you may have been in those places as well. And I went out to the nurse and I said, I know you can't tell me how long this is going to take. I know you can't let me know but this is such agony for them and I want to to tell them something that will help them. I want somehow to get this process, you know, they're just, they're not gonna leave and they're just gonna sit there and be in all that pain. And she nodded and she said, you're right, I can't tell you, I'll be in in a few minutes. And so um, we went, um, I went back in and was sitting with them and a few minutes later she came in and she readjusted a few things and fixed, fidgeted with a few things and then she went back out. And within 10 minutes, he was dead. And as we left, the family and I left, it was uh, noticeable to me that she was sitting at her desk and weeping. And I thought, a woman of compassion. I'm, I'm so moved by, by that. But it wasn't until many years later that it dawned on me that she had upped his morphine. She had upped his morphine. The day-to-day -day life in a hospital is different from the moral teaching. What we don't know is when we will get it and when we won't. Do we want our healthcare choices framed by the moral teaching of the Catholic Church? So what about all this? What do we do with all of this? Well, I have to say, I think that for most of us sitting in this room, it'll have very little impact on our lives. Most of us, most of us, live in a bit of a privileged bubble. Um, we have finances that uh, afford us choices that many people don't have. Uh, we have lots of us a high degree of education which helps us navigate this in a way that someone who has not um, kind of gone through some of the experiences we have uh, can do. We have resources available to us in this area. We have resources available to us. We can go to Planned Parenthood if we need to. We have local Planned Parenthood um, to go to. Um, but in many places, they don't. In Texas, it's shutting, they've shut down women's clinics um, over and over again. And when, when we come to the whole issue of, of, of abortion, um, <coughs> when we come to, to that question of terminating a pregnancy, what what we have to keep remembering, and it's hard to do this because the anti-abortion lobby keeps, the, keeps the, the fetus ahead, up in the up in bright lights, and so we get worried about when conception starts and when it ends and all of that sort of thing. Um, but the issue when Roe v. Wade was decided 20, 30 years ago now, anybody remember? 73. 73, so 41 years ago. Who knew it could be that long? Wow. When Roe v. Wade was decided, what it changed wasn't whether women had abortions or not. Remember? It didn't change whether women had abortions or not. It, meant it changed whether they lived through them. And hearing my mother talk about her sister having a back alley abortion in the 1960s, and how she sat and waited, crying, wondering if her beloved sister was going to live through it. Let's remember that when we talk about abortion services, we are not talking about only the life of the fetus, but also the lives of women who, in desperate places, will take desperate means and injure themselves and damage their fertility.